All right, so next up, Ewan Pearson, producer, songwriter. Wonderful, hand that over straight over. Hi, everybody. Um, we've only got half an hour, and um, I want to give you a very quick kind of scoot round the way I work, some of the different ways I work. Um, I'm concentrating particularly on a couple of key ideas. One is what I've kind of come to call platform agnosticism, which is don't get too hit up with one particular software setup or one particular setup altogether. Um, one of the things I've learned from doing a lot of different stuff for different people is it really helps to be flexible and to move um, from software package and from format to format um, and to think about some of the issues that arise as a result of that. Um, and also, I want to talk a little bit, I just want to show you a few things about my studio and the way I work with kind of hybrid sort of digital analog setup. I have a fairly um, small studio space here in Berlin. Um, I got rid of my analog desk a few years ago, but I'm still really crazy about analog stuff and sort of integrating that with computers. Um, for the nerds, I'll show you a diagram I made when I set my studio up a year and a half ago and replugged everything else in. And I will this is what we you. like to see at CDR. There you this go. This is this is proper nerd business. Um, yes. <laughs> you're gonna have to duck out the way a bit yeah, there, Tony. <laughs> All right. This is this is my how I remember everything is plugged in diagram. Um, basically, my studio. We can start. This is the kind of the centerpiece, which is a metric halo interface called a ULN8. Everything pretty much plugs into there, and then the speakers, which are these fellows here are plugged in through an SPL um, control box. So that gives me the kind of control center um, equivalent that you'd get in a mixing desk. I'll show you some pictures in a sec. Um, this ULN8, a uh, really brilliant interface made by an American company called Metric Halo. And that's kind of the centerpiece of everything I do. Um, I have a mixer called an XSUM which basically all my analog synths and things like that plug into, and a mic preamp called a Great River, which is a very nice sounding dual um, mic preamp. It's based on the 1073 mic pre's, um, and it sounds really good. The other thing which is really important to me is this thing here, which is a, a, a Neve compressor called a Portico. Um, basically everything I do goes through analog compression um, at the final stage, this is my this is my room. Um, I have various guitar pedals, which live um, on top of the rack, and these are all these are all hardwired into the software. So basically, I have a second interface, a second metric halo interface, and so all of these pedals are available as sends on my mixer to make it as easy to use and as accessible to use as plugins. And all these software packages now have dedicated ways of getting in and out to analog gear really easily. The other thing that I love um, in my studio setup, which is a hardware, a digital hardware thing, is the um, UAD2 processing card. Um, and it's the best value for money of any thing I've ever bought for my studio. It's it's pretty amazing. So basically most of the EQ plugins I use and a lot of the compression plugins I use come from the UAD2. Um, and I don't have one here, so. What's so good about the UAD2 cards? Um, I think it's the fact that, I mean, the idea is that they are, um, they are simulations of hardware stuff, but they're not afraid to put um, plenty of color, basically, and they're not afraid to um, to to distort and to um, affect the sound in nonlinear ways, in the ways the ways that we used to love machines for doing. Except rather than buying one um, one eleven seventy six compressor, you've got as many as your uh, computer power will allow you, so you can start putting them over different channels and not just be restricted to kind of bussing and sends and stuff. Um, I started off, like many people, um, on an Atari ST when I was a kid using a uh, program called Creator. And then when, once you've got your, your Mac computer and you could run audio and MIDI at the same time, this was the kind of, this was the massive breakthrough. The idea that you could have audio and MIDI information 
all on the same page, all on the timeline. Um, I guess most of you are younger than I am, so you, you may not, you weren't, you've probably been working on these things since that was the case, but I can say that the first time I got my hands on uh, a sequencer that did audio and MIDI on the same page, it blew my tiny mind. When I started doing remixing, if somebody wanted to send me parts, they sent me a DAT. And basically the DAT had a mono track on the right-hand channel, and then it had time code on the left-hand channel. So what I had to do was play back from my DAT machine um, the time code strip to DAT, and record each channel in one by one. So basically to build up my multi-track used to take, I don't know, four hours or something. This before I could even start work on the remix. Um, otherwise, you'd have to do things like I'd have a sampler and I would have each, let's say, if I was doing a vocal remix, each line of the vocal or each word of the vocal would go on a different key on the keyboard and then it would be triggered by MIDI. And that was how, I mean, and I don't want to, go on, don't want to be too old-timerish about this, but we worked hard in those days and you don't realise how easy you have it with your laptops and you're able to, and goodness knows what. <laughs> we suffered. Um, Okay, let me actually play some music because it's probably what you want to um, get to. So, what I was saying before about platform agnosticism. Have your software, learn your software, learn the tricks, learn it inside out, but don't get too tied down to one particular platform. The most important thing from my point of view is to be able to switch between them, to nimbly move between them when you need to, and not to get too tied down to one particular platform. I mean, it's possible to do a remix entirely in Ableton. Um, the last remix I think I did entirely in Ableton was a mix I did for Foles about three years ago, the, the band from Oxford. I mean, something like Ableton for a remix like this is obviously, it's a great platform to use because I had to do quite a lot of time stretching. Um, I think the original tempo of this song, which was Olympic Airways, was 140 beats per minute or 142. It's pretty fast anyway. And uh, I wanted to keep a lot of their original parts but make it into a house tempo. So something like Ableton is, vi you know, is absolutely vital because you've got to do a lot of time manipulation. As I said, manipulating the time frame is the most important thing. So bunging into Ableton and being very quickly able to, um, to change the tempo and to get other beats together. When I use Ableton, I tend to... I tend to throw audio into it. I tend to use a lot of samples. I tend to use a lot of loops um, from CDs. I tend to nick sounds from other people's records that I like. Again, Ableton, I think, tends to push you in certain ways, which is it's very good at the whole point of the elastic nature of audio, and you're able to throw things into it quickly and get a good result. So it tends to push you down certain paths. Um, let me play you a bit of the mix. <laughs> Let's disappear till tomorrow Let's disappear till tomorrow So with something like this, I know when I start that I want to use a lot of the band's original stuff because I love the song. So something like Ableton enables me to, me to get lots of their parts in, to re-edit them and arrange them quickly and to get other sounds in. Um, so something like Ableton is great for this. Um, because I, I don't need to generate too much of my own stuff. I'm essentially boosting the drums, kind of doing a sort of... It's more of a disco edit type remix, to be honest. It's, um, I'm not re-harmonising it, I'm not writing new musical parts for it. Um, I wrote a couple of new keyboard lines for it, a couple of hook lines. Um, but most of what I was doing was basically turning it from a kind of band punk funk thing into a, into a sort of Balearic house. Track. Everything else is pretty much drums. I mean, I, I think, what else did I add? I added um, some profit. I, added, I did add some analog synths. You're good, Ewan. You didn't just do it on Ableton. You did actually use a real instrument. There you go. World of Mars. But that was just quickly and roughly recorded from a synth back into Ableton. As was this part below. 
It's another little hook line. But something like this, which is relatively simple in terms of scope, um, as I said, the idea of just making it work for the dance floor, not really wanting to do a great deal um, of kind of musical improvisation or exposition, means it's very easy to stay in a programme like Ableton. These days, two years later or three years later, I would, um, I would actually bounce the tracks out and I'd put them into Pro Tools and I'd mix it in Pro Tools. Um, because a friend of mine once made me do an A-B between bouncing it down in Ableton and then putting it all into Pro Tools and doing it as a, a zero level uh, mix in there. And people at Ableton would hate me for saying this. Ooh. But you could definitely hear the difference. I, and I'm not, I don't have the best ears in the world and I'm not a sort of, I'm not an audio snob um, too much. Yeah, when you say there is a difference when you A-B, then what did you identify as the particular characteristics? Um, stereo image. Okay. Um, and certainly a kind of weight in the bottom octave as well. Okay. I mean, it, people will argue about this because when you're summing things digitally, it should be the same. The practical benefit also of moving, say, when you've finished a song in, in Ableton into something like Logic or Pro Tools to do some final tweaking is just forcing yourself to take a break, forcing yourself to reevaluate and saying, right, that was my moment of creation. That was the bit when I was putting the music together. And now this is a separate section. This is me thinking about mix. This is, I mean, we, we all mix on the go. We all make sounds on the go. And I, I've had frantic arguments with engineers that I've worked with um, producing bands because I want to start mixing the drums just after we've recorded the drums because I like the idea of having the drums sound kind of like what they're going to sound in the final mix. And my engineer thinks this is horrible because in his slightly older-fashioned way of looking at things, you do the mix at the end of the song when you've recorded all the song. Again, there's no right way, wrong, wrong way of doing it, but one of the good things about forcing yourself to move from one platform to another, for example, in the way that I do, mixing either in Logic or Pro Tools later in the, later in the game, is it does force you to... It switches your mindset and makes you think, right, I'm, I'm taking stock and I'm thinking about this in a different way. So even if when you've moved into the other software package, you've only done a couple of tiny level changes and you may be, but then you might hear a part and think actually that would do, be nice with a little bit of extra echo on it or maybe I need to re-EQ this bit. So I think, I mean, I'm a terrible ditherer. I mix everything I do like five or six times. So um, I'm maybe not the best person to follow in terms of best practice for this kind of thing, but I think certainly that splitting up your workflow between the sort of composition and the, uh, the mixing stage definitely has some advantages. Um, a remix that I was just finished for a friend of mine in London, for, his, for Tim Paris, for his label marketing. Um, this one started in Ableton, uh, and then it went to Logic, uh, and then it went back to Ableton, because I decided that the first version I did was um, not to my liking. I made a quick arrangement um, using the parts here, and I kind of, it was a vocal house thing, and I've done this sort of funk arrangement. <laughs> I think basically because I was doing it entirely in audio um, in Ableton, I basically got just stuck around this kind of two chord figure. And for me, Logic is a program where I feel happy to play stuff and write parts. And so although you can do all that with Ableton and it has the MIDI capability, for some reason I'm more comfortable in Logic. So in order to force myself to actually do something musical rather than throwing kind of um, chunks of audio together, I was like, all right, I'm going to export it from Ableton and uh, move it into Logic and start actually doing some music. So you can see now that my Logic page is basically comprised of rendered audio from my original... Um, Ableton session, so I kept that little because I really like that. But 
But I've basically used um, Ableton Live to add some more housey drums and... And uh, got busy with some uh, built-in soft synths in Logic in order to do a kind of more acid house type in arrangement. As soon as I got the soft synth out and a keyboard and actually started playing a line in, rather than re relying on um, chopping up and, um, and looping audio, which is what sort of Ableton was kind of pushing me down the road towards, um, I became much, much happier. Um, but of course, I still have Ableton in there doing more drums, doing the things that it does so well, basically warping some loops. Basically, the first two thirds of the arrangement are this kind of acid sort of house thing, and then I wanted it to have a complete shift. I think basically because I got so fed up with the kind of two chord funk thing in the previous version that I wanted it to just do something which you had no, um, not particularly radical, but something that you'd had no forewarning of. <laughs> It's a bit quiet because the compressor's turned off in Logic. Um, so yeah, with this, very much this thing of getting stuck in a particular mindset in relation to one particular bit of software, um, by forcing yourself, by deciding, right, I'm going to take the time to render files and move into a different location and start again, um, you are basically tricking yourself into trying some new methods. Um, and getting unstuck. I mean, it's the great thing about Ableton is it's very, very, very easy to render files um, and get out into other software. Hello. Um, hi. I saw you were using the track delay in Ableton. Uh, was it for uh, latency or for groove adjustment? And is it also available in Logic? Uh, yes. Uh, yes to all of those. Basically, um, one of the biggest things, um, as far as I'm concerned, in, in constructing dance music is, is I mean, obviously, groove is a massive important thing. So the ability to lay off particular sounds and to push certain sounds later, even if it's only by a few milliseconds or earlier, uh, makes such a difference to the some permanent delay, permanent <laughs> reverb going on there. Um, it makes such a difference to the groove of the track. Again, without wanting to sound like an old fart, when we started, we used to have to trigger MIDI and um, basically, if you triggered more than a couple of beat, couple of um, sounds on the same beat, because MIDI is a serial, um, uh, a serial system, you know, it doesn't allow th it doesn't allow two things actually to fall exactly on the same time. So basically, if you do, if you sequence loads of different instruments entirely on a MIDI sequencer, um, after a while, certain things that hit on the same beat will start to flam and they'll start to spread and they'll start to separate. So you can have a brilliant groove with five or six parts and then you add a seventh or eighth part <laughs> and the whole thing falls apart and you're kind of pulling your hair out and trying to move things back and trying to offset other things um, and it's one of the wonderful things that we don't have to worry about these days um, so instead we can use delay um, basically to create groove knowing that what we do will stay exactly where we put it and won't move so does that, does that help thank you cool um, yeah, so what I was saying about not getting too stuck in one particular, one particular program and so one particular mindset. As I said, it, it's great with Ableton because Ableton, you can export all your files with their effects, with their settings, with one button in 10 minutes. It's not so easy with Logic because they're making it quite hard to do these days. So there's a few tips that you need to know to do with busing and various things in order to make sure that all your parts come out in time with one another. And if you're working in Pro Tools, um, you can't do offline bouncing. You can only do real-time bouncing. So one of the tips is definitely to kind of end up in Pro Tools if you can, rather than starting in Pro Tools. Because as anybody that's ever had to, um, to make stems for a track, for a remix of something that they've done in Pro Tools and had to put like a whole day aside to do it. It's an extremely tedious process. So 
Ableton and things like that lend themselves very well to starting there and then getting out. Um, as I say, you can do everything in Ableton, and I've done several remixes which I mixed and, and finished in Ableton, but um, I would advise you to get out more um, if you can and uh, try some of the things that other software has to offer. Uh, another question? I would say that they're both creative. <laughs> um, it's just different types of creation. I mean, with production, um, it's kind of like about seven different jobs. So sometimes you're essentially listening to what bands are doing and what artists are doing and acting as a sounding board. So basically listening to them, giving them feedback, saying that you like certain things, don't like others, suggesting other ways that they might go forward. Um, sometimes you're massaging their ego. Sometimes you're kicking them up the arse because they're lazy or they haven't done something well enough. Um, which you do have to do sometimes, actually. You have to be quite unpleasant from time to time. But um, if they pay you to be unpleasant, it's okay. Um, and then other times it, I am employed to come in and do a lot of arrangement. Um, I'm trying to think of an example recently where I've done a lot of, there's a lot of me in there. The Delphic album, I did a lot of additional sort of programming and keyboards and stuff. And I try, it's not that I try not to do that, I'm happy to do that whenever I can, but I see myself as a producer in terms of bringing, um, the, uh, bringing more of what's unique and individual to the artist out of them. I don't really want their record to sound like a Ewan Pearson record in terms of having particular kind of musical style. Um, but then there are times when people kind of go, actually, would you do some, would you actually do some work? Will you actually add some stuff? So if they do that, then I'm happy to. But, but anyway, um, I hope that was useful, and thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan. Very insightful. Um, okay, so another quick switch around and then open CDR.